There are wasps everywhere up here. Yeah. Okay. Ah! I'm about to put the first sill plate board up. Whew, these things are heavy and they're massive. These are huge two by 12 treated uh, boards and I'm being attacked by wasps this whole time as well. Ah! <laughs> ah! Let's get it up on the wall. Ah! Oh, wow. This two by 12 is the sill plate and it is gonna go down like this. That's good. The edge of the sill plate will be to the edge of the uh, styrofoam on the outside of the wall. As you can see, I have it sitting on top of the, the J-bolts. Here's a bolt and I'm just gonna hit it. Don't wanna drop this board down into the house. So uh, be very careful. So when I hammered the board onto the bolts, it made a mark. I'm gonna drill a hole at that mark at every bolt location. Wow, look at that, huh. almost crushed my fingies. That worked out great. There's gonna be two of these stacked on top of each other to get my walls to nine feet tall on the inside. I'm not going to put the washers and the nuts on here yet. I'm gonna get started on the next one. So I had to take all of the boards off because I realized I shouldn't be putting just wood on the concrete. There should be a barrier, which is this stuff. And this is sill sealer. It's a foam and it goes between the concrete and the wood. And I'm going to add in this caulking material to seal it up, keep bugs out. I had all of the boards on and I had to take all of them off. I have the layer down. Both of these layers have this caulking material under it, you can see there. First board goes on top of that. And when I bolt this down, it'll squish this material and create a very good seal that bugs and bugs and air can't get through. That's the hope. I'm gonna talk to the camera, don't laugh at me. We got our seal boards down and we have a big stretch caulking material between each layer of foam, then board, then the next board. Where'd you go, Lawrence? We're actually going to mark with pencils, markers, whatever, on these boards to get a square and then get an idea of where each roof truss is gonna set. And I guess that's just the next step. It's kind of boring stuff, but very, very necessary. So not much to film, but uh, yeah, I'll get what I can. I'm not gonna go into every detail. Essentially, we marked some reference lines, took some measurements. This is going to be different with everybody, which is why I'm not going to go into detail with exactly how we did ours. But we found this corner first. After measuring off this corner, we made sure that we were the exact distance that way, square to that corner, the exact distance that way, square from that corner to that corner. You get the idea. Everything's square and everything's exact. These trusses are being set two feet on center, meaning the center of the truss is two feet to the center of the next truss. Here's a truss, so on, all the way down, every two feet. And that's pretty much it. That's what we figured out. Where the trusses are going, how far this way they're gonna set, how far this way apart they're going to set. And I'm fortunate that Lawrence is here I could have figured this out myself, but it wouldn't be nearly as quickly and it wouldn't be nearly as fun. Lawrence is a good guy. He's fun to work with. Gonna have problems getting him on camera though. There's Lawrence. You're on camera, Lawrence. So the next problem we're up against is how to get these trusses up onto this. Dan is coming back with a sky track, which is basically a forklift and go off road and extend really high and far. We're gonna give that a shot. Watching people put trusses on homes has always intimidated me. Um, even small projects like sheds and stuff, the trusses are always intimidating because they're giant heavy things. Once we got it figured out, it was fairly simple, but we had to figure it out. And that actually took quite a bit. Lawrence, Dan, and I got one truss up on the very end of the house. And 
We tried to use the strong back scaffolding that you would have seen in the last video to walk it down the sides of the house. We were like lifting up and, and putting it over the uh, strong backs. That was a nightmare. That was not going to work. Out here in the center of the home where there was no support, the truss was not happy. It was creaking and cracking and not doing good. So we had to do something different. We left that truss in. And what I ended up doing was building a two by four wall right down the center of the house at the height, the same height as our exterior walls. And it ran down the center and I braced it out. Then we were able to take all the ice ICF bracing off of the home and move it out of the way. Then Lawrence got on top of that ICF wall. I got on top of that ICF wall. Dan would load them on to the house while Lawrence and I tied a rope around it and just drug them all the way down the length of the house. And then once it got to where we wanted it to be, Zach and Dan came in with long two by fours and pushed the peak of the truss up into place. Before Dan put the trusses on the end of the roof. He screwed in, you can see those short boards between the peaks. So Dan screwed those on to the peaks on the ground, then lifted them up to us. And so when we stood them up, they just got together and hit at the perfect distance away from each other. And I showed you guys before, on the sill plates were marked where each of these were gonna go. And so we knew where they were gonna go visually here. The blocking kept it from getting too close up top and it just seemed to go pretty smoothly. This might be the biggest change we've made to our house that went that quickly. That was just a, it's a massive visual change and we did it in, what we in Danny, two days. Even though we were able to get all the trusses rolled on, there's still a lot left to do. If you look over here, we have these two by fours and we had to measure these really carefully so that we could get these um, and set them up as braces for our trusses. And we still have to do the rest of the house. Was I close? I think I was really close. Okay. Now you try and jump and touch the ceiling. Yeah. These are nine foot walls. What's a basketball hoop? What's a pro basketball Ten. hoop? 10, geez, how would those guys do that? Ugh. You get it? No, I didn't even get close, I don't think. I gotta lose like 50 pounds and work out more. When we first dug our hole, it felt like our house was gonna be really small. And then we poured a concrete pad and it felt like our house was really big. And then we put up our walls and it felt like our house was gonna be really small. And now we have our roof and it feels like our house is gonna be really big again. We have a slab on grade, so we don't have a crawl space. Up in these trusses though, right here, we're gonna have storage. And on the other end, we're gonna have storage too. And in the middle, we have a vaulted ceiling. Rolling the rafters onto the house was the fun part. That was one of the funnest jobs so far, but it's taking us much longer to actually brace them in a way where they won't just fall over. The details on the plans that come with the rafters, they do have, I guess, requirements or recommendations. Pretty sure it's a requirement uh, for bracing. I'm not an engineer or anything, but it did not seem like it was going to be sufficient to hold up the, the trusses on their own. And Lawrence and I just got done finishing bracing to what we think is going to be optimal stability for our for our trusses. One thing that surprised me was how much adjustment these needed. On the ends of the house, they're exactly where they need to be, but out in the middle of the truss, they could be off inches uh, from where they needed to be. And so we had to get one completely squared up, the gable ends, and then tie in our own two by four bracing. And on each of those two by four bracing, we would mark where each subsequent truss would go, line them up, nail them in. The very next thing we need to do is do what they call, I guess the gable, the drop gable, and outriggers. I think you can see it from the camera. The pitch of this gable end, which is the very last truss, is actually lower than the very next truss. Can you see that on camera? And it's lower by the exact width of a two by six so that I can make my own two by six outriggers is what they're called, tie them into the truss just behind the gable end and they'll overhang using this gable end as a, you know, a rest and I want two foot overhangs. In order to achieve the two foot overhang, I can't just cut this at two feet because this board is tying into the rafter behind it, which is two feet behind it. So I actually have to cut this at four feet, but then I can't actually cut it at four feet because the subfascia has to go on the face of it. Subfascia is an inch and a half thick. So instead of 48 inches, I take it back to 46 and a half inches. That way it ties into the rafter that's two feet behind it, it would hang over one foot, 10 and a half inches, so that when the subfascia is attached to it, there'll be a full two feet of overhang. Having said that, let's cut this at 46 and a half inches. Now that I made this outrigger, I can just throw it up here. We'll nail that on, and then that will create the overhang that we need. And I'm gonna do this 
every two feet on down the wall. Here are two outriggers that we installed. We want to put blocking in between them. Jam that down there that I'm needing to trim these up. I was not born to be a roofer, that's for sure. And we'll see if that made it any more accurate or not. This board here needs trimmed. And this has been the process this entire time. And it's actually perfectly spaced already. I don't have to do anything. It's important to be as accurate as you can be, as often as you can be, because uh, your future self will thank you for the, for the accuracies when you're trying to put roof sheathing on or drywall or whatever it might be. You're gonna want, you're gonna want to have been kind to that person in the future.